in the book of Habakkuk tonight. If you'll stand and follow along as I read from verse 12 onward until we get into chapter 2, a couple of verses there. Art thou not from everlasting, O Lord, my God, mine Holy One? We shall not die. O Lord, thou hast ordained them for judgment, and O Almighty God, thou hast established them for correction. Thou art of purer eyes than to behold evil, and canst not look on iniquity. Wherefore lookest thou upon them that deal treacherously, and holdest thy tongue when the wicked devoureth a man that is more righteous than he. And makest men as the fishes of the sea, as the creeping things that have no ruler over them. They take up all of them with the angle, they catch them in their net, and they gather them in their drag, therefore they rejoice and are glad. Therefore they sacrifice unto their net and burn incense unto their drag, because by them their portion is fat and their meat plenteous. Shall they therefore empty their net and not spare continually to slay the nations? I will stand upon my watch and set me upon the tower, and will watch to see what he will say unto me, and what I shall answer when I am reproved. And the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision and make it plain upon tables that he may run that readeth it. For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it shall speak and not lie. Though it tarry, wait for it, because it will surely come. It will not tarry. Behold, his soul which is lifted up is not upright in him, but the just shall live by his faith. Heavenly Father, again, we rejoice at the opportunity we have to gather in your house. Open your word, Father, and plumb its depths that we might go away from here tonight with a greater understanding. Open our hearts that we might behold something wonderful out of thy law tonight. Father, we pray that you'll be with those who are not able to be here, that perhaps are on beds of sickness, that you'll raise them up. Encourage the downhearted, Father, and above all, help each one of us rejoice in the salvation that we have in our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. You may be seated. If you have studied this book at all, and I pray you have, trust that you have, you'll find that Habakkuk is a pretty profound book. It goes pretty deeply into the mysteries of God in a way that is unlike all of the most of the Bible books. Not all of them are like this one. The Apostle, the Apostle Paul's pastoral epistles, for example, are quite straightforward in their presentation of truth. Habakkuk is a profound book because it raises deep questions about the workings of God in history, why God does what he does, why he does it the way he does it, and why he sometimes does nothing. God says that although the righteous may not understand everything that he's doing in history, they nevertheless live by faith, as we read here in Habakkuk 2.4. This statement is so important in God's word that is picked up and noted three times in the uh, New Testament. Twice by Paul, once in Romans, once in Galatians, and then by the author of Hebrews as well. Now we come to the point here where Habakkuk had a problem. He lived through a period of national revival, followed by a period of spiritual decline and when he called out to God about it, God replied that he was sending the Babylonians to be an agent of judgment on his people. And that isn't what Habakkuk wanted. It isn't at all what he wanted to hear. Habakkuk had been looking for another revival. But in addition to not getting that revival as he wanted, he now had the further problem of reconciling God's actions with what he knew God's moral standards to be. It would be kind of like crying out to God about the state of the visible church in America and hearing that God was going to destroy it by an ISIS invasion. 
our thought at first would probably be to be critical of God's uh, people. We would have pointed out the laxness of the theological standards and even open heresy in some situations, the lack of discipline and open immorality in others. We would have been asking for a renewing movement of God's Holy Spirit, and we would have been really stressed out that our prayers weren't being answered. But then, after God replied that he was going to destroy the church by an invasion of utter unbelievers, we would find ourselves protesting. The church might be in a deplorable state, we would argue, but it really wouldn't be all that, couldn't be all that bad. And even if it were, it wouldn't seem right that it should be destroyed by another un, totally godless nation. We might ask at this point, as Habakkuk does, why? Why do you tolerate the treacherous? Why are you silent when the wicked swallow up those more righteous than themselves? Habakkuk 1.13. That's a paraphrase, a Bauer paraphrase there. But we run into this kind of thing on a personal level too. Suppose you lose your job because a person who has it in for you, so to speak, misrepresents something that you've done. Why does God allow that person to succeed? Why did he allow this situation to uh, develop? I can speak to that particular issue from personal experience. I left a secure job with the Boy Scouts of America and went out to Elkhart, Indiana to be the director of camping for the YMCA. I was there for three months and was released from my job because there was a man there who wanted my job very badly and he claimed uh, workplace discrimination. When I appeared on the side on the job, or when I went out to the YMCA for an interview, he wasn't anywhere to be seen. But after I got there, he raised this issue, and I ended up coming home. Well, it came out to be a better deal for me anyway. I got a better job, and, and God is good, isn't he? But that's the kind of thing that can happen. Suppose you're sick, and the doctor misdiagnoses your case, so that you get worse. You have to ask the question, why has that happened? Suppose you experience some great disappointment or the death of a loved one, the breakup of a marriage. For the younger folks, maybe it's failure to get into the college that they want. So the question comes, doesn't God care? You're not perfect. But why should someone who isn't even a Christian have it so good while well, we lose out. So when we face problems like these, it's kind of important that we follow a procedure for dealing with them. When things go wrong, a lot of folks, you know, have a tendency to withdraw and pull back and avoid the situation. If they drop out of Christian activities, they stop going to church, and they pull back into their little spiritual corner and pout. Others repudiate their past, <clears throat> concluding that they must have been wrong about God and renounce all their belief in him. Well, so the question is, how should we deal with problems like that when they come up? Let me suggest four steps as we study Habakkuk. First, and this is always a good idea, stop and think. Most of us have a tendency, I think, to talk first and think afterward, if we think at all. Um, James tells us in 1.9 that everyone should be quick to listen and slow to speak. So what happens when we speak first? Well, we often muddle ourselves by fanning the flames of our own unbelief or muddying the water of our ignorance 
when we shut up and think, we begin to sort things out and, and let the light of God's word in and light the pathway to the action that we should take. Secondly, we should restate basic principles. When you start to think, don't begin with your immediate problem. Go back a ways. Begin further back and apply the strategy of an indirect approach. That kind of approach is sometimes very important in one's spiritual life. And that's the principle of finding sound footing. All of us have been in situations in the wintertime where the sidewalks are slippery, where the snow has been shoveled off, but there are still treacherous icy spots. How do you walk in that situation? If you're like most people, you keep your eyes down and you place your feet very carefully, don't you? We need to do the same thing spiritually. Our problem is a slippery spot. But surely not all of our experiences with God are like that one. Get onto the parts that are firm. Remind yourself of the things that you know. And then you'll find that the problem begins to fall into proper perspective. And principles for solving it begin to appear. Thirdly, after you stop to think, after you've restated the basic uh, principles, those things that you already know, then apply the principles to the problem. The fact of the matter is, the problems are capable of solution only if they're put into the right context. The way to interpret a difficult passage of scripture is to consider the context. We sometimes make the mistake of, mistake the meaning of a phrase because we take it out of context. But when we put our problem text into its context, the context will generally interpret the text for us. The same thing is true of a particular problem that is causing our concern. And then fourth, if you're still in doubt about the problem or the solution to your situation, commit the problem to God in faith. And this is probably the most important point of all. Suppose you have stopped to think. Suppose you have gone back to basic principles. Suppose you have applied those principles to your specific problem. What should we do if we're still as puzzled then as we were at the beginning? Should we give up? Should we withdraw or repudiate what we had professed before? No, we shouldn't. At this point, it's best to leave the whole matter with God. From here on, God, it's your problem. Let me know when you have the answer. So just to review real quickly, here are the four points. You stop to think, restate the basic principles, and apply those principles to your particular situation. And if you're still in doubt, then commit the problem to God in faith. That's a biblical method of dealing with problems that we can't seem to come to grips with. Now, <clears throat> let me show you that this is precisely what Habakkuk did when he was confronted by the Lord's prophecy of a Babylonian invasion. First, Habakkuk stopped to think. He didn't write a great deal, but he was a good thinker, great thinker. He wrestled through his problems and thought deeply before writing anything. We know that because of what he did right down. Secondly, he reminded himself of first principles. Well, what principles were they? As we read Habakkuk 1.12 and the following verses, we find that they're the most basic of all theological principles, namely the attributes of God. And Habakkuk begins with this statement. Art thou, art thou not from everlasting? Imagine, if you can, his train of thought here. Um, 
in the previous two verses, God had been talking about the Babylonians, and uh, he was going to, stand, to send to invade Israel. And look at, looking at verses 1, uh, 10, and 11 here, he said, And they shall scoff at the kings, and the princes shall be a scorn unto them. They shall deride every stronghold, for they shall heap dust and take it. Then shall his mind change, and he shall pass over and offend, imputing this his power into his God. Habakkuk at that point must have reflected on the nature of this God of the Babylonians. He must have asked himself the question, who is this God anyway? Coming up with the conclusion that the God of the Babylonian is only an idol. He's really nothing. He's even less of a reality than the Babylonians. Then he must have, Habakkuk must have compared him to the God of Israel, Jehovah, whose name begins verse 12, and who is an everlasting God. Habakkuk must have reminded himself that uh, Jehovah was before anything. Before anything came into existence, Jehovah was and is. And he would be long after Babylonia had faded away. Even Habakkuk couldn't understand all that God did. He would have comfort in knowing that he served the everlasting God. His second sentence in 112b refers to another of God's attributes. He says, O Lord, my God, mine Holy One, we shall not die. Holiness the most important characteristic of God. And in the Bible, it's the attribute that's stressed more than any other. We don't often, I don't think ever, find the Bible speaking of God's sovereign name, loving name, or wise name repeated two or three times in succession. But in the Bible, time after time after time, God reminds us of his holy name. It's the only name that's re that it's the only attribute that's repeated three times. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts, says Isaiah 6 3. And in Revelation 4 8, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. This attribute of God is also especially important for the matter Habakkuk is raising. He asked the question, is it right for God to allow the wicked to destroy those more righteous than themselves? What he's really asking is, is God doing the right thing? Is God acting rightly? In the context of the set of questions, it was important for Habakkuk to remind himself that God is the Holy One. He also refers to God's sovereignty he writes also in verse 12, O Lord, thou hast ordained them for judgment, and O mighty God, thou hast established them for correction. God controls all of history. The Babylonians didn't simply rise up on their own. God raised them up. Further, he was raising them up when he wanted to raise them up, and to operate in the precise geographical area in which he wanted them to operate. God is sovereign to do what he wants. This is something that David would have understood right away because of his great prayer at the uh, dedication of the goods that he had collected for the construction of the temple in Jerusalem. Turn with me to First Chronicles uh, chapter 29. At verse 11 and verse 12. Thine, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty for all that is in the heaven and in the earth is thine. Thine is the kingdom, O Lord, and thou art exalted as head above all. Both riches and honor come of thee, and thou reignest over all, and in thine hand is power and might, and in thy hand it is to make great 
and to give strength unto all. God is sovereign. He'll do what he wants. Another characteristic of God that Habakkuk mentions is faithfulness. He, is, he expresses it by saying that God is a place of security for his people. He calls him a rock. Well, as you look at your Bibles, you say, my Bible doesn't say that. But it does in the Hebrew. And its usage, its usage here is meant as a place of security. There are a number of words in the Hebrew that that mighty, uh, where it's used, and you, it, it means several different things. Uh, but here it's used as a, as a rock, an illustration of a rock, a firm foundation on which somebody can build a secure footing. This place of security in those days of Habakkuk was often a fortress in which a soldier could run and be safe. God is in all these things. The personal relationship of the prophet to God is stressed repeatedly. He says, O Lord, my God, my Holy One. So what did Habakkuk do once he had reminded himself of these great attributes of God? He stopped to think. He had restated the basic principles and next he took the third step and applied these basic principles to his problems. I think his reasoning might have been something like this. If God is everlasting, if he was here before anything we, came to, we, we know about came into existence, and will be here after all our problems have faded away, then the Babylonian invasion is not his last word however that final invasion might seem to us. His relationship to us is more important and more lasting. If God is holy, as I know him to be, then the outcome of this invasion, since it's being caused by God, will not be evil, but good in the final analysis. A future embracer of God said it a little bit differently. What did Paul say in Romans 8.28? That all things work to, to good, to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. Yeah. If God is sovereign, then the invasion is not a matter of mere chance. God is still in control. Finally, if God is faithful, then the victory of the Babylonian armies might, must be for the good of the people. It doesn't indicate that he has abandoned us or his people in the case of Habakkuk. They were still his people. So think about what Habakkuk had accomplished by his reasoning. If the Babylonian invasion isn't the last word in God's relationship with his chosen people. It isn't going to be evil in the final analysis if it's not the result of mere chance. If it doesn't indicate a change of mind on God's part, then what must the invasion be? The answer is it must be a tool in the hand of God for the correction and purification of his people. It's to do them good. Habakkuk expresses his confusion by saying, O Lord, thou hast ordained them for judgment, and O mighty God, thou hast established them for correction. So what we have at this point is the answer to the, to the first half of Habakkuk's problem. He stopped to think, he's restated the principles, he's applied them to his problem, and he's arrived at the answer that the invasion must be a tool in God's hand for the correction and purification of his people. But Habakkuk isn't satisfied. He can see the ultimate purpose of the coming invasion, 
but he's still perplexed about the moral implications of using the Babylonians and ungodly people to punish Israel. Now, Israel is far from righteous, but the Babylonians are even worse. They were actually terribly wicked. Isn't it wrong for God to exalt such a wicked people? Isn't this condoning evil? At this point, Habakkuk seems to be doing exactly what God, or what he did with the first part of, of his problem. Once again, he stops to think, restates his principles, and then applies them to his problem. In verse 13a, he writes, Whoops, I better get in the right book. Thou art of purer eyes than to behold evil, and canst not look on iniquity. This time the procedure doesn't work, because the difficulty is bound up with the principles. It is precisely because God is too pure to look on evil and can't tolerate wrong that the problem of God's using the Babylonians as a tool arises. So what is Habakkuk going to do now? He still doesn't have the answer. And at this point he comes to step four and does what was mentioned in the summary of those point, these points that I made earlier. He commits the problem to God in faith. He leaves the problem with God. And that's how he begins chapter two, verse one. I will stand upon my watch and set me upon the tower and will watch to see what he will say unto me and what I shall answer when I am reproved. Habakkuk has gone as far as he can go in his reasoning. Now he needs to know more if he's going to make any progress. So he waits upon God for that instruction. He says that he's going to wait to see what God will say to him. And this is worth looking at in some detail because it answers the question, how do we leave a problem with God? What should our frame of mind be? Well, first of all, we should try to detach ourselves from the problem. And that's not an easy thing to do. But Habakkuk suggests this when he says he'll go to a watchtower. A watchtower was often built in a grain field or a vineyard to provide a place for the guard to keep an eye on things happening around them, what was going on in the harvest. It could also be a tower built into the walls of the city. But when Habakkuk says he's going to stand at his watch, he's saying, I've been down in the valley with a problem and haven't been able to solve it. So now I'm going to draw apart for a while and leave it with God and I'm just going to simply detach myself from the difficulty. And this is where Christians often go astray. We have a problem, and we've applied the prophet's principles for dealing with the situation, but we still have no satisfaction, and we still don't know quite what we ought to do. So having failed to reach a decision, despite seeking the guidance of Holy Spirit, there's nothing more to do but take it to the Lord in prayer. What often happens then is this. We get on our knees and we call out to God and we tell him what is worrying us. We tell him that we can't solve the problems or the difficulty ourselves. That we can't understand and we ask him to show us his way. And then the minute we get up from our knees, we begin to worry about the problem again. We also tell other people about it, and from what may be a very wrong motive sometimes. You know, I think that it's actually a case sometimes that we're rather proud of our problem because it shows that we're serious Christians and that we're wrestling with deep spiritual things. We want to let other people know about it. But stop to think about that. If we're doing that kind of thing, we haven't really left the problem with God, have we? Leave your problem with God. 
leave your problem with God. When you do that, we don't have the right any longer to brood about it. Secondly, we should expect God's answer. Now, just because we've left a problem with God doesn't mean we should forget about it entirely. But once more, Habakkuk's image of the watchman is helpful. The watchtower is detached from the crowds of people below. But the person who enters that watchtower does so in order that he can keep an eye on the landscape. He's on duty, so to speak. He has work to do. And that work is to watch and see what is going to happen. Habakkuk says that he watches to see what, will he, what he will say unto me. How do we look for God's answer? How does God speak to us? Well, the primary way that God speaks to us is through his word. Sometimes God directs us by what used to be called intimations. That is, uh, deep personal feelings concerning the way we should go. God often directs us to what we call open doors or closed doors. That is, God opens an opportunity for service or he takes it away. Those things still occasionally enter in. But still the primary uh, and ultimately the only fully reliable method of talking and knowing God's direction is to uh, answer the per our perplexities through scripture. Anybody who is in the habit of regularly reading the Bible knows that occasionally things can happen. We have a problem and we're unable to solve it and we've left it with God. Maybe that we've forgotten about it, even, even forgotten about it temporarily. But one day we're reading a passage and suddenly a verse pops out at us and we realize that, that, it, realize that it contains a solution to the problem or the situation that's been troubling us for so long. It's God's answer to the problem that we have previously left with him. The final point that we should make tonight is that we should be persistent in our expectations. Habakkuk also implies this by his image. He says he's going to stay in the watchtower until God answers his question. You know, God likes that kind of tenacity. He likes us to stick at it. It's a kind of persevering attitude God likes. And God honored it in the case of Habakkuk. For the entire second chapter is God's answer expressed in a series of judgments upon those who are not upright and who don't live by faith in the true God. And the answer, which we'll look at in the next lesson, is this. God says, I've heard your prayer, Habakkuk, and I understand perfectly what's bothering you, and here's my answer. He says, it's true that I've raised up the Babylonians to punish my people, but that doesn't mean that I'm endorsing their evil or their sin. On the contrary, he says, I will judge them in due time. I've raised them up, and I'll bring them down again. They will suffer the full outpouring of my wrath. Meanwhile, my people will be purified of their sin and restored to my favor. And while this is happening, the one who is truly righteous must live by faith in me. He says, write this down. And make it plain, so that anyone who reads it may live by faith. And that's what Habakkuk did. He wrote it down in his prophecy. And we're to read it. And we're to live by the faith of the, in the same great God that answered Habakkuk. So next time we'll consider this matter of living by faith. Father, we thank you for the opportunity once more to open your word tonight. As we go forth from this place, help us to consider, reconsider the things that we've heard and looked at in your word this evening. And help us to take our needs to God in prayer and leave them there until such time as the answer is ready or we're ready for the answer that you have for us. Now, Father, help us also tonight to bring to our mind the needs of 
some people who can't be here tonight for whatever reason, that we might bring them freely to the throne of grace and leave them there because of the one who went to the cross for us and made it possible for us to come to the throne of grace tonight. We'll thank you, Father, for what you're going to do. Help us, Father, to remember each other in prayer as we depart from this place tonight. Lift one another up spiritually. And we'll thank you for what is going to be accomplished in this place. In Jesus' wonderful and holy name, amen.